Um, I don't know if you noticed this, but I feel like the sickness that goes around in homes just happens in waves. Do you notice that? It's like, for us, we've got three kids, so as soon as one kid gets sick, we just know, watch out, because it's gonna sweep through our whole house. So that happened a few weeks ago. One kid got sick, and before you know it, all three kids are sick, and then my wife is even sick, and somehow I managed to stay out of it. So of course, I get to take care of everybody else. So my wife said, here's a list. I need you to go and get these prescriptions and these over-the-counter stuff for the kids and me and everything. So I go to Walmart, I do the prescription fills, and, and I needed to just pick up some of the kids' cold medicine. Right? So I'm like, no big deal. Usually Becky takes care of a lot of those things, but she's sick, so she hands the responsibility to me. And I am a husband that is responsible. I am a father that is responsible. So I start looking for the cold medicine that she asked me to look for. Do you know what I found? Not one type of cold medicine for kids. Not two types of cold medicine for kids. I found about 57 types of cold medicine for kids. And so here I am standing with this little list in this huge aisle. And I feel like I got smaller and smaller and the, and the, the racks got bigger and bigger. And I started looking, I just need like kids cold medicine. And so I went and asked the pharmacist, like, I just need like some normal kids cold medicine. We're like, well, what kind of cold medicine? I said, like, you're failing to hear my question. I just need normal, regular kids cold medicine. It's like, yeah, that aisle down there. You mean the, the mile long aisle of 57 different types? It was overwhelming. There were so many different types. Well, do you want daytime or do you want nighttime or nap time or during all daytime? And it was like, well, do you want this brand, this brand, this brand, this brand? Well, this has this stuff in it, and this doesn't have this stuff in it. This has these flavors. These have these flavors. It was insane on how many choices you have for something as simple as cold medicine. So I finally just guessed. I said, we're just going to go with this one. They're all sick. They're not going to know anyway what I get. So I finally just pick one. And there was a couple other things on the list. So now I'm already kind of in overwhelmed mode. And there was something, again, simple toothpaste. Do you know how many brands of toothpaste there are? Now I'm already worked up after getting that medicine. Now I'm like, I've got to make the same choice with toothpaste. It's just incredible. It's almost unbelievable how many choices that we have. And here's what I've noticed in my life, and I, I'm imagining you have noticed this in your life as well. We go through life and we experience the too much, right? There's just too much. And when too much meets what I would call not enough, there's a feeling we all feel, overwhelmed. When too much meets you're not enough, when life's too much, in some cases, it's as simple as just too many choices. I'm in an aisle trying to pick out toothpaste and over-the-counter cold medicine for my kids, and it's just too much. I don't have enough experience. I don't have enough knowledge. I don't have enough time. I have too much to do at work and not enough time. I have too much debt, and I don't have enough money. I have too many things going on in my head, and I don't have enough time to quiet them down. Too much, an hour not enough, leads us to a place where we feel overwhelmed. We just feel weighed down and we don't feel like we can walk any further. It's almost paralyzing when we have that feeling. When we see too much, but we can't do enough about it. Sometimes it's just too much change. That's usually more of the emotional. And that doesn't mean it's bad change. It can be. But maybe it's starting a new family. I remember when we first had Connor, our firstborn, and we come home, there was this sense of, you know, you got the car seat, we walk into our house, and I got what you might know as dad eyes. Like, now what? I have a human being that I'm responsible for. What am I supposed to do with it? <laughs> right, you have those dad eyes where it's just too much. Right, when you, when you get married, when you have kids, if you're a blended family, bringing two families together, the feeling of overwhelm, of being overwhelmed. Even through grief and through loss, we can be overwhelmed with the emotions associated with grief and loss, loneliness, depression, going through a season where this is the first time you've been alone because you've lost a loved one. You wake up after being married to somebody and with somebody for so long and you wake up for the first time and they're not there anymore. Too much and not enough. And the sense of overwhelming, of being overwhelmed, seems to just be drowning you. So what do we do with that? We are going to be overwhelmed. Nothing we look at this morning is going to be a prevention of being overwhelmed. There's not a way to avoid it. There's not a way to prevent it. 
We know we're going to be overwhelmed and we know we are going to respond in some way. We all do that naturally. If you go back and think through your moments of too much and not enough and how you naturally respond to feelings of being overwhelmed, we all respond in some way. Everybody's different, but we all will respond and we all will be overwhelmed. So the question we really want to ask is, well, how should we respond? What's the healthy way to respond when we feel overwhelmed? What would God tell us when you are overwhelmed, not if you are overwhelmed, but when you are are overwhelmed, here's how to begin to respond to life and how to begin to walk through it. That's the question I want us to ask. We are going to experience the too much versus the not enough. So how, with God's help, how are we supposed to walk through it? If you have your Bibles, head over to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1 starts a new era for the Israelites. They're getting ready to step into something new. And there's going to be a lot of feelings of too much and not enough. They're they're leaving their past behind. They've been slaves in Egypt. They've been wandering around the desert for 40 years. Moses has been their leader. And now they're being ushered into a new era. They're going to be walking into what God has called the promised land, the, the land that he had promised to give them. But before that happens, there's an individual who is no doubt unbelievably overwhelmed. And his name is Joshua. We're going to look at part of his story. So if you're at Joshua chapter 1, that's where Joshua begins to take leadership of God's people, God's nation, the Israelites. And he is going to be responsible for taking God's people into this next chapter of their life. But before you look at Joshua chapter 1, I want to read out of Deuteronomy 34. That is just a couple pages to your left if you actually got a Bible, because this is the end of one era and it's the beginning of the next. Deuteronomy 34 shows the death of Moses, who had been leading God's people, and everybody knows Moses. They made a movie about him. Everybody knows Moses. Not everybody knows Joshua at this point. So let me tell you what is written down about Moses and see how this begins to maybe hit home, how you can resonate with Joshua and his sense of feeling overwhelmed. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 10. This is after Moses died. Since then, since Moses died, look at this. No prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his officials and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. I mean, that's a, that's a, a, a wonderful picture of Moses, isn't it? No one has ever been like Moses. No one has ever done anything the way Moses could. No one was as powerful and as mighty as God used Moses. Now, if you turn the page to the very next one, I told you Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... Notice how Moses was referred to. Moses, the servant of the who? The Lord. The Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' aid. That means Moses' servant, Moses' assistant. Joshua is the assistant to the regional... Never mind, you get it. Some of you got that. Moses' servant. And Moses, my servant, is now dead. Now look at what God says. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them. To the Israelites. Now hold up there for a second. Deuteronomy chapter 34. No one has ever been like Moses. No one could ever be like Moses. No one has ever been used in such a mighty and powerful way like Moses. Moses is just great. Moses, 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 Moses. You turn one page to Joshua chapter 1. Right on the heels of Moses' death, now you have God speaking to Joshua. And God says, Moses is now dead. So Joshua, and I think it's funny that he is son of Nun. I think there's a little pun in there. Son of Nun, I know you were the aide to Moses. I know you were his servant. So now you are going to follow in his footsteps. And you got to remember, this is on the heels of God saying, no one has ever been like Moses and no one could ever come close to being like Moses. So Joshua, you're up. (laughs) Remember Moses? You know, you were his servant, your old boss. Yeah, now it's your turn to take his place. Now, nowhere in this first part do we see Joshua have a chance to talk back to God. Yet he will eventually. But right here and right now, it's just going to be God talking. And I am positive that Joshua was thinking plenty, even though he didn't have the opportunity to speak anything. But put yourself in Joshua's shoes for a moment. I mean, you have seen your people go through 
slavery and then go through wandering around in the desert and you have been in close proximity. You have been the right hand guy of Moses, this great guy, Moses, Moses, Moses. Everybody loves Moses. God even loves Moses. Moses and God had this face-to-face relationship and Moses dies and then God taps you on the shoulder. You're up. Talk about too much, maybe not enough. No, 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 God, you don't understand. That's too big for me. I can't lead this nation. I was just his servant. I was just Moses' errand boy. I just went and got him coffee whenever he wanted it. That's all I did, God. I'm not Moses. I can't be like Moses. You want me to lead the entire nation? That's just, that's just too much. Maybe I could lead just a small group of them. And you could get a better leader, a stronger leader, a more experienced leader to take them into the promised land. I don't have enough experience, God. I don't have enough leadership. I don't have enough know, know-how. I don't have, I'm not a warrior like Moses. I didn't grow up in, in a palace like Moses. Think of the too much versus the not enough that Joshua had to be feeling in that very moment when Moses dies and God taps him on the shoulder and says, you're up. Had to be feelings of overwhelmed, of being utterly overwhelmed. But God continues, I said, doesn't give him a chance to speak. So God starts in this way, verse three. He starts with a promise to Joshua. Verse three begins to lay out this promise that God was giving to Joshua and his people. Verse three out of Joshua chapter one, God says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Well, that's important, isn't it? You know the guy that I'm asking you to follow? You got it. You know, you're not like him, but I'm not asking you to be like him, but I'm still promising you the same thing. Verse four, your territory will extend from the great desert, from the great river, the Hittite country, and on and on and on, given these big boundaries of where your land will be. Verse five, no one Again, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. Again, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So he paints this wonderful picture for Joshua. He says, I know, I know, I know. It feels like too much. And what I'm asking you to do in the position that I'm putting you in, it feels too much. And I recognize, Joshua, God had to have been thinking, I recognize that you feel inadequate. So let me remind you of the promise. What I've promised Moses, I'm promising you. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Remember the borders. Remember the, great, the greatness of this plan that I have put into motion, God would be saying to him. That's what that promise means from God to Joshua. And that's how Joshua would have interpreted it. Like, okay, God's kind of like calming me down a little bit. Have you ever had somebody do that? You walk into an overwhelming situation. Like, no, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. You're gonna be okay. <laughs> You're gonna be fine. Here's why, and God begins to lay out this massive promise, the same promise that he had given to Moses, he's now giving to Joshua. Now he goes on to give him some reminders. So here's the promise, Joshua, just like with Moses, I'm gonna be with you. And then he gives him these reminders. Verse six, many of you are probably familiar with this language, it's on coffee cups all across Christian bookstores. Here's what it says. Verse six, be strong and courageous because you, he's talking to Joshua, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. That's the promised land. Verse seven, again, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the laws my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate, we're gonna come back on that word. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Once again, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And here he wraps it up with the same promise. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He'll be with you wherever you go. Now, what's interesting in that part of Joshua chapter one, pretty famous section of scripture, once you understand the context of he's saying this to Joshua because he most certainly would have been feeling very, very overwhelmed. But for Joshua, this was nothing new. Let me say it again. For Joshua, what God just said, this whole be strong, be courageous, be careful to obey, I'll be with you, that whole thing, that whole spiel, God just went on and on and on about all the repetition of strong, courageous, careful, strong, courageous, be very careful. That was nothing new for Joshua. Check this out. This is fascinating, at least to me. You don't have to necessarily turn there. But if you were to go to back a few more pages, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 31, when Moses was still alive, but it's towards the end of his life. 
He recognizes he's about to die. He knows that God is going to choose Joshua to lead the people. So Moses does something interesting. Before God told Joshua this, Moses told Joshua that very same thing. Deuteronomy chapter 31, Moses gets in front of Joshua and all of the people and says this in verse 6 out of 31 in Deuteronomy. Moses says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of the people that you are going to be overtaking. For the Lord God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Then it says, Moses summoned Joshua and said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. He will be with you. You want to know one of the coolest things ever is when God quotes you? (laughs) Moses told Joshua and the entire Israelites this back before God did. And then God says, remember what Moses told you? Remember who you're worried about living up to? All those expectations, those self-imposed expectations. God says, remember what he told you? He says, let me remind you what you already know. Find it, that's really what we need. When we are in the middle of the too much and the not enough, when we're in the middle of feeling overwhelmed, we don't need something new. That just goes into the too much category usually. It's like, I just can't handle one more thing. Don't tell me one more thing. In the middle of too much and our not enough, we just need to be reminded. God doesn't tell Joshua anything new at the very beginning. All God does says, remember what you already know. Remember what your mentor told you. Remember what God would say is, my servant told you. Remember what Moses already told you. Be strong, be courageous, be careful of the direction that you go. Why? Because God is going to be with you. So all God does a few chapters later, after Moses dies and now God taps Joshua on the shoulder, all God does is remind him. So that's what this morning is. This morning is just a reminder. You're not going to probably get anything brand new. You're you're not going to be told something that's just earth-shattering, You might not walk out of here with some huge like, oh, that totally makes sense. I'm hoping you walk out of here and says, oh, I already knew that, but now I need to do that. (laughs) We need that, right? So often, instead of trying to get something new or something more, just be reminded of what God has already told you. Be reminded of what you already know here. They're reminders on how we are to respond. It's nothing new. Joshua didn't need anything new. When you're overwhelmed, do you need one more new thing? No. You need to be reminded of what you already know. So if you find yourself in that space of life's too much and I don't feel like I have enough, be reminded of those three things that God reminded Joshua of. And he said them over and over and over again. The same thing that Moses said over and over and over again. Three words, be strong, be courageous. And then there's this last one that gets kind of thrown in there and sometimes glossed over. Even says, be careful. All three of those words are repeated multiple times in this short section of God reminding Joshua of here's how you respond. Yes, I know it's a big deal. Yes, I know it's a lot to ask. But remember, be strong, be courageous, and be careful. So we're gonna look at those reminders. And here's why that's important. Because even though you are overwhelmed and even though I am overwhelmed and we feel overwhelmed, your overwhelming situation, it does not overwhelm an overcoming God. That's what God is saying to Joshua. The fact that he says, I will be with you, says, I know you're overwhelmed and I know this seems like a really big ask for you, but God's like, but I'm with you every step of the way. In fact, he says it twice, doesn't he? He bookends his talk with Joshua with it. I will never leave you or forsake you. And then he goes through the whole be strong, courageous, and careful part. And at the end, because I will never leave you. I will always be with you. God is a God that overcomes what overwhelms us. So that's that first part here. Strong, he says, be strong and courageous. Now, strong is not speaking to the literal strength of Joshua or the little, literal strength and capabilities and abilities of the Israelites or any of the officers or any of the other men or women. It's, it's specifically talking to Joshua about more of be firm, be sure, be certain, or maybe a better word in there would be be confident. Be confident in this. Now, confidence is one of those things that can waver, and I would say, well, first look at what or who you are confident in. God does a couple things to actually build and develop Joshua's confidence, and don't misunderstand. Confidence does have to be built. It has to be developed. It's not just, here you go. 
right? That's the thing with strength, right? You don't just get strong. You have to work out over and over and over and over and over again. If you go to a gym one time, says, I'm ready to get strong. And you step into that gym and you hang out for a half hour and you walk out and he says, what has not happened? This isn't the way this is supposed to work. No, you would be told by a personal trainer, we'll come back tomorrow and then the next day and the next day and the next day. So confidence has to be like strength, developed. It has to be grown. So God does some things to help develop his confidence. The first part has to do with that promise. Be confident, Joshua, because again, I am with you. It says no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. If that doesn't give you confidence, I don't know what will. (laughs) When God looks at you and says, in your situation, whatever your situation is, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. He reminds him of the promise. That develops our confidence. You want to grow in your confidence of God? Know his promise for your life. It's difficult to be confident in what you don't know. Grow in your understanding of his promises and you will grow in your confidence. The other thing that God does here, and this is interesting, you might have missed it, is in that very first part of verse six, when he says, be strong and courageous, he gives a reason why. There's a because in there. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land that I swore to give them. Say the word you, you. God says, be strong and courageous because you, Joshua, are going to lead these people. In other words, God is saying, I picked you. I chose you. This wasn't an accident. This wasn't a surprise. This wasn't a mistake. This isn't plan B. We're not just winging it here, Joshua, and I hope this works out. God says, no, 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 be strong and courageous because you, I've picked you. I've intentionally chosen you. So let me say that word back to you, you. In whatever situation you're in that feels overwhelming, you are in that, and it's not a surprise to God. I'm not saying God necessarily caused it or any of those things. I'm saying, but he's not shocked that you're where you are. He's picked you to walk through that for a reason. God is intentional. It's not just him cleaning up messes and trying to figure out how to make this whole thing work. No, he's with you, and he's chosen you. The family that you're in, you're in it for a reason. The job you have, you have the job for a reason, at least in this season. This church, you're part of this for a reason. He has picked you. Take confidence in knowing that he's with you and he's chosen you to be exactly where you are in this moment and in this season. So be confident for two reasons. You got this because he picked you, he's chosen you, and he's got you. Be confident because you've got this. Whatever you're walking through is too much as it feels. You've got this. He wouldn't give you something that you couldn't handle. But he's also got you. He's not gonna leave you. He's not gonna forsake you. He's not gonna make you do it on your own. So he begins to build Joshua's confidence. Be strong, be confident because you've got this and I've got you. The second thing he tells Joshua is be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be confident and courageous. Now, when he says courageous or courage, let's make sure we understand the same thing. Most people, when you say courage, you think of like a brave heart scene or one of these mighty warrior scenes. And that's a great image or visual of being courage. But then you are somebody like me. You're like, yeah, I'm not William Wallace. So I don't see how this is going to work out for me. Let me give you a better understanding of courage. Heels and toes. That's how I want you to think of it. Heels and toes. Heels is you're constantly almost like backing up. Have you ever tried to walk around on your heels? It's unbelievably difficult because you're constantly wanting to fall backwards. It's actually easier to walk on your heels if you're moving backwards. It's very difficult to walk on your heels moving forward. Now let me talk about toes. Toes, you're leaning forward. Toes, you're anticipating. Toes, you can move forward in something. That's what courage means. The posture of courage is toes, not heels. So when you get placed in a situation that feels like too much, do you go to heels or do you go to toes? Do you go to heels and say, ah, this isn't for me, and you start backing up? Or do you say, all right, God, you're with me. You're never going to forsake me. I have no idea how we're going to get through this, but I'm all in. Doesn't mean you enjoy it. Doesn't mean you love it, but I'm going to walk through it because I know he's with me. You get on those toes. Don't get stuck on your heels. And God understands what he's asking Joshua to do. If you keep reading through Joshua, read chapters two, three, four, five, six, you're gonna see plenty of opportunities for Joshua to jump on his heels. 
but he stays on his toes. Joshua, it's time to go march around Jericho. That'd be a great opportunity to get on those heels. Joshua says, okay, what are we gonna do? God says, you're gonna march around the city. Great time to get on those heels. You just want me to march. Okay, we'll start marching. How many times are we gonna, this would be a great, you see what happens here? Instead of getting on our heels, what if we got on our toes? He says, be strong and courageous. And he says it again later on, be strong and very courageous. Keep moving, keep walking through this. Be courageous, why? Because God is with you. The only reason we can continue to walk through the things that are overwhelming is because he is with us. You're gonna see that as a common theme. He's with you. Now, something hit my brain as I was studying through that this week. I believe I have said that phrase, God is with you, to myself and other people probably more times than I even know. And I recognize something that doesn't get old. As many times as I have said to myself and people around me, God's with you, I never get tired of saying that and hearing that. And I recognize something else. You probably haven't heard it enough. You hear it from me on Sundays, but do you hear that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday? So let me just take a moment, and if you hear nothing else, hear this. God is with you. But you don't know what I've done, and you don't know where I've been, and you don't know what situation I'm in. God is with you, no matter where you are, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what the too much and the not enough is and the gap between it, he remains with you. Jesus said the exact same thing. I will never leave you. I will be with you to the very end of the age, he said. It is a common promise that we hold on to that gives us courage. I can walk through this. I can stay on my toes because he's with me. So be confident because you've got this and he's got you. Reminder that he's with you always and every time in every moment. He does not walk away from you. So take courage in that. Don't lose heart. He's with you. The last thing that God reminds Joshua of is to be careful. Let me read this section again, pick up on what to be careful of. Be strong and very courageous. Here it is. Be careful to obey all the law my, Mo, my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it right to left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Here's this word I told you to remember. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be, here it is again, careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. This idea of being careful. In other words, it's careful to walk that straight line. Careful to walk in the direction that God is leading you because when we are overwhelmed, we respond, I said earlier, we respond differently already. We act, especially in, in moments of, of feeling overwhelmed, we act very differently. When things don't go right, we act differently. When my car starts to run out of gas, it starts to act differently. When my kids don't get their naps, they act very differently. When I don't eat on time, I act very differently. So when we are overwhelmed, we act differently. And so here God's reminding Joshua, now I know you're gonna have the tendency to wanna like, Act differently, but be careful. Not to the left, not to the right. Stay right where I'm leading you. Well, how do we do that? And there's that word. You remember what I told you to remember? To do what day and night? Meditate. Meditate on it day and night. That's the solution. That's one of the only things that God gives him that's not a reminder. Be confident, be courageous, be careful. Be careful in the direction you go and how you act. And so here's one of the only things that God actually says. So here's something you can do in the midst of it. It says, meditate on it day and night. Meditate on this day and night. Now, this word meditate's a little different than what you might think it is. A lot of times when you think meditate, you kind of think of a home, right? That's probably what's in your head right now. Meditate literally means to murmur or mutter or groan. So here's the way I would explain meditate to you. Think back to the last perfect meal that you've ever had. I mean, just the best meal. If you're sitting down eating, somebody makes this meal, and you get it in front of you, you take a bite, what do you do? Mmm. You do one of those, don't you? And if it's really good, it's just like, mmm, mmm, mmm. Oh, that's good, right? You do one of those. If you've ever been awake to see a sunset, 
which I was reminded this morning, it happens more than, once a, more than once a week. It actually does happen. And so when you see it, what do you normally do? You do a, wow. You do like the silent breathe out, the silent exhale. You do one of those. If you've seen a good movie, you're just like, mm, man, that was good. You do one of those, you do the little, oh, man, it was good. When your preacher says something so amazing, you go, ooh, mm, that's good. No, 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 you missed the response. Laughing wasn't the response. Let me try that again. When your preacher says something super good, you go, whoo, that's good. That's it, yeah, mm, mm, mm. Right, the mmms. It's the muttering, it's the uttering, it's the groaning, because something's just so good you don't have words for it, so you just go, mmm. What if we treated God's word like that? When you're reading through this, that's what meditate means. It's just you're so amazed and in awe of just like, mm, oh man, God, that's good. Uh, you don't have words for it, so there's that constantly happening. That's what God is telling Joshua. That's what you need to be careful to stay in the direction that I'm leading you. He says, do it how often? Day and night. We're, double, we're sure on that, right? You want to double check? Yes, day and night. Do we do that day and night? And that's not to make you feel guilty. That's just a, well, let's do that. Doesn't mean you have to memorize it. Doesn't mean you stop everything that you're always doing. But do you have those moments, day and night, always, constantly, where things are just in your head of, oh, yeah, God, you're just so good. Oh, I needed to be reminded of that. So get your YouVersion Bible, Bible app. Get the verse of the day. Put your Bible next to your nightstand. Put scripture on your car rearview mirror, just in a small section, not the whole thing, because you do have to be able to see about the backside of it. I mean, do something so that day and night you are thinking about God's word. So the reminders, be strong or be confident because you've got this and he's got you. It's be courageous. Stay on those toes. Don't get in the heels. Stay on the toes because he's with you. And be careful. Oh, be careful to follow God's leading. Corey Ten Boom, she gave this quote that I think is very fitting for us this morning and a great reminder. Here's what she says. If you look at the world, you will be distressed. Right? Too much. There's too much going on. There's too much this. There's too much that. There's nothing we can do about it. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. There's the not enough. There's too much going on and there's nothing I can do about it. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll be depressed. If you look at God, you'll be at, and say it with me, at rest. Why? Because you've got this and he's got you. Because he's with you every step of the way. Bottom line. Here's your reminder. Nothing new, most likely, for most of you in this room. But I find that I need to be reminded more than given something new more times than not. Here's your reminder. Overcome, not avoid, not prevent. Overcome being overwhelmed with trusting in God. That's it. Simple, no. Reminder, yes. Overcome whatever is overwhelming you right now with simply, significantly trusting in God, that he's got you, that he's with you, that he's chosen you, that he's not surprised, he's not shocked, he's not worried. Be strong and courageous and be careful. So put your trust in him. Psalms, as I said each time, is full of responses to life. Here's your Psalms response for this week. May this be what you meditate on, right? Every day, maybe this is something you put around your house, you put it in your car, you talk about it at the dinner table, put it on your phone, here it is. Take a picture of it, make it your background on your phone or your computer if you need to. Here it is, Psalm, Psalm 56. When I am afraid, when I am overwhelmed, when I am terrified, when I am worried, when I am nervous, when I am anxious, what do I do? I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise. There's that meditate. I meditate and I praise on your word. In God, I trust and I'm not afraid. Oh, and I love this next part. What can mere mortals do to me? What can mere mortals do to me? What, what, what truly can be thrown at me in this life that God cannot overcome? The answer is nothing. So I put my trust in him. When this life throws something too much at me, 
I recognize that God is enough for me. When life throws too much at me, I recognize it's not too much for God. That's why my trust goes in Him and only Him. Last thing I want you to see. Remember how it started out? So now Moses was dead. Remember, he was the servant of the, remember? Some of you remember, go back. Servant of the, remember? Servant of the Lord is how it started. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is, do you remember that one? His aide, his servant. And then he goes through this life of trying to be strong and courageous and careful. If you go to the very, very end of Joshua's life, all the way to the end. Chapter 24, verse 29. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Did you catch it? Did you see what was different? Chapter one, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of who? Moses. Chapter 24, after a lifetime of being strong and courageous and careful, Joshua, son of Nun, servant of the Lord. It changed everything. Those simple reminders changed everything. Verse 31 goes on. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who believed him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. You wanna experience everything the Lord has planned for you and your family? Be confident in him. Be courageous, stay on your toes. Be careful to follow his ways. And you move from Brian, son of Phil, servant of a bunch of people, (laughs) to the end of my life, all I want to hear is Brian, servant of the Lord. And it's a lifetime of not perfection, but a lifetime of being reminded constantly, being confident in God, being courageous because you know he's with you. And instead of veering off on either side or the other, you do your best to stumble in the right direction. You follow his word carefully every step along the way. My prayer for you when you are overwhelmed is that you would trust in God at the end of your life. You're known as a servant of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Jesus, that's our prayer. And honestly, right here on this stage, I'm not praying that you would remove the things that overwhelm us. I'm not asking that you would take away our stress. I'm not asking that you would take away our our anxiety. I'm asking that you wouldn't take away our worry. In this moment, I'm asking that we would first just trust in you. There are always gonna be things that overwhelm us. There are always gonna be things that worry us, stress us. Those will not go away until we are standing with you. So God, in this life, may we overcome them with trusting in you. God, may you begin to identify in our hearts, speak to our minds in this quiet moment of where we are still not putting our trust in you. May we put you above all things. May we trust you with our marriage. May we trust you with our kids. May we trust you with our community. May we trust you with our world. May, you tr- may we trust you with our finances. May, you trust, may we trust you with our decisions. May we trust you as we step into an office tomorrow morning. May we trust you as we get into our car this afternoon. God, may we simply and significantly, but in every moment of every day, trust you. May we trust you. What is overwhelming to us, you have already overcome. May our confidence be in you. May we be be courageous because of you. And because we trust you, we're careful to follow you all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen.